Dead America. Kansas. Part 5. By Derek Slayton. Chapter 1. Day 0 plus 48. Atticus, having spent what felt like an eternity at his desk, finally rises, his legs unsteady and weak from prolonged stillness, nearly betray him, necessitating a moment of self-care as he massages them back to life. The familiar yet always unwelcome sensation of pins and needles prickles through his limbs, but gradually subsides, allowing him to regain his footing. He chuckles to himself, a sound echoing in the quiet room. Can't even sit and read through documents without hurting myself. That's a fun age to get to. Atticus muses aloud, a hint of irony lacing his words. In an effort to fully reawaken his legs, he begins to pace across the floor. It's during this mundane act that Evelyn's knock at the door disrupts the silence. Come on in, Evelyn, Atticus calls out, his voice steady and welcoming. Evelyn enters, her presence marked by the comforting aroma of a meal. She carries a tray bearing a steaming bowl of soup so hot that its vapors are visible, accompanied by a hunk of fresh bread. It's a simple yet deeply nurturing gesture. Sun's going down, so I figured you might be hungry, Evelyn says, her voice imbued with a caring undertone. I can always eat, Atticus replies with a soft smile, his eyes momentarily leaving the papers strewn across his desk. As Evelyn sets the tray down, her gaze briefly falls upon the computer screen, catching sight of a highlighted date, day 22. Important. Her curiosity piqued, she asks, still chaos out there in Kansas? Atticus shakes his head, a gesture of resignation more than denial. You don't know the half of it, and because I like you so much, I'll spare you the details, he says, his tone a mix of humor and a darker, underlying seriousness. That bad? Evelyn's question is tentative, laced with concern. He nods solemnly. Let's just say I've had my yearly fill of human misery. Evelyn's expression shifts to one of sympathy, her words faltering. I'm sorry. I don't even know what to say. Atticus forced a smile to reassure her. All part of the job. Although I have to say, I am thankful I only have to read about this stuff. I'll take that any day over experiencing it firsthand and then having to write a report about it. Evelyn latched onto the change of tone. You see a lot of bad stuff as a ranger? There's a reason I retired at my youthful age, Atticus replied with a twinkle of charm, getting her to laugh while avoiding the grim memories. How's Susie doing? He asked, redirecting the conversation. She's doing good, curled up on the couch with her stuffed animal, fighting with all her might to stay awake for the end of her movie. Evelyn chuckled affectionately. I've already caught her snoring twice, though. The mental image of his young daughter, safe and happy, brought a smile to Atticus's worn face. Before nostalgia could fully take hold, however, Evelyn slipped back into an authoritative tone. But you sit and eat before it gets cold and get to that important report. Yes, ma'am. Atticus nodded obediently as she left, quietly pulling the door shut behind her. Settling into his chair, Atticus inspected the hearty soup and tore off a chunk of bread, dipping it into the fragrant broth. Yeah, that's some dangerous stuff right there, he murmured after swallowing the rich morsel. Good thing we're on rations, because I could eat an oil drum of that. After a few more satisfying bites, he set the tray aside and clicked open the ominously labeled report. Okay, Madison, let's see just how important this is. Chapter 2 Day zero plus 22. Shortly after dawn in Great Bend, Kansas, Connie found herself in the dimly lit kitchen of a weathered old house in Great Bend. The gas stove crackled with the promise of boiling water, casting a warm, faint glow across the room. Through the window, she observed a few survivors, their silhouettes etched against the early morning sky, toiling away constructing makeshift barricades that wound around the roads and encircled the houses. It had been an unrelenting week. 
a ceaseless symphony of labor orchestrated by the entire community, Connie included. This relentless effort had left her arms feeling as if they'd been pummeled by a professional boxer. She rotated her shoulders to restore some semblance of circulation, but her gaze landed on the wall, and her heart sank a little. Hanging over the kitchen table, a family portrait loomed. At its center sat an elderly woman, her age etched into the deep creases on her face, seated in a chair that had been dragged onto the front yard of the house. On either side of her stood adults, presumably her offspring and their significant others, accompanied by a multitude of children. Connie couldn't bring herself to count, but she assumed there were at least 20 souls in that photograph, all clustering around the elderly lady whose home Connie now occupied, as much as she wanted to resist. A disheartening thought gnawed at her. Damn, she whispered there's a good chance that every single one of those people is gone. As Connie uttered these words, Madison, still half asleep, made her way into the kitchen from the adjacent room. Did you say something, Connie? Madison asked, her voice groggy from sleep. Connie shook her head, her eyes still fixed on the family portrait. Just thinking about how it's likely that all those people are gone now, Connie replied with a heavy heart. Madison, rubbing her eyes, attempted to inject a glimmer of hope into the conversation. With a family that big, they might be scattered all over the country. This isn't exactly a hot spot of civilization. So there's a chance some of them are still out there. Connie's skepticism lingered. Would you bet money on that? Madison, with a hint of humor, retorted. I only bet on sure things. Connie playfully abandoned her previous suggestion. There goes my next idea of taking a girl's trip to Vegas. Madison, now fully awake, welcomed the idea with enthusiasm. Oh, I'm all in for that, no doubt. Thought you only bet on sure things, Connie teased. Well, if we go to Vegas, it's a sure thing we're going to load up on buffets, get a little crazy and maybe even find ourselves a couple of strippers to bring back to the room. Connie couldn't help but smile at Madison's spirited response. The thought of a carefree trip to Vegas in the midst of their grim reality was a rare glimmer of hope in their lives. It's a shame we didn't find each other earlier in life, Connie remarked, her voice filled with genuine affection. As the tea kettle began to whistle, the shrill sound pierced the room, drawing their attention. Connie swiftly grabbed it and began pouring hot water over a tea bag in her mug. She offered a silent question with a raised eyebrow to Madison, who nodded in agreement. Without a word, Connie prepared a cup of tea for Madison as well. Madison, looking at the steaming cup in her hands, couldn't help but comment. Still no coffee, huh? Connie shook her head with a hint of regret. At least not for us. Madison, with curiosity piqued, prodded for more information. Wait, someone found coffee, and you didn't take it. I thought you were in command here, girl. We have needs. Connie chuckled, sharing the backstory. I know, but Piper was the one who found it on a scouting mission yesterday at a farmhouse. She took out three of those things on her own, just to get her hands on it. Unfortunately, there was only about half a jar so I told her to keep it. Madison couldn't help but nod in approval. Oh, it was Piper. I'll allow it then. We should totally invite her to our Vegas girls weekend. Connie had her doubts. Not sure she strikes me as the Vegas type. Madison countered confidently. A hardcore badass like her. Oh, she'd love Vegas. There's always drunk guys who want to get handsy and are in need of having wrists broken in self-defense. She'd have a field day. Connie had to admit, Madison had a point. Yeah, you're probably right. I'm just happy to see her up and about. She was in rough shape when I found her. Concern flickered across Madison's face as she broached a more serious topic. Have you talked to her about the situation? You know, with her military friends who are taking over the state town by town? Connie sighed, acknowledging the difficulty of the subject. Yeah, we've had some chats about it. Madison pressed further, 
sensing the impending clash. And Connie reluctantly revealed, and she prefers to go on scouting missions to far out of the way places. Madison's tone grew serious. I hate to say it, but sooner or later, she's going to have to pick sides. Those people keep pushing westward towards us, and it's only a matter of time before we run into them. Connie nodded in agreement. Their conversation was interrupted as they both noticed Max approaching the house with purpose in his stride. Connie gestured toward the window. But that looks like it's going to have to be a conversation for another day. Madison's gaze shifted to Max, and she let out a sigh. So much for a lazy morning. Max knocked on the door and Connie welcomed him inside. Morning, Connie. Madison, Max greeted them. Madison inquired, How's it going out there? Max, with a hint of urgency, reported, Busy. A couple of scouts came in overnight and dropped off a couple of pickup trucks filled with barbed wire and metal stakes. Should be enough to do the entire outer perimeter of the town. Concern creased Connie's brow as she questioned, is that not going to stretch it too thin? Max shook his head confidently. If my measurements are correct, we should be able to get three rows all the way around. It won't stop a mob, but it'll be enough to catch strays that try to wander in. Connie turned to Madison for advice, given her experience. We've both seen what mobs of those things can do. I don't think barbed wire is stopping it, regardless of how many rows there are. Connie considered Madison's input before responding. Okay, catching strays it is. Get the guys working on it when they can. Max nodded in acknowledgement. Will do, but that's not all. Max just stood there silently, his eyes drifting longingly over to the still hot tea kettle as both Connie and Madison sipped their beverages. He looked like an unattended child hovering next to the candy rack at a grocery store just hoping someone might offer him a piece. Finally, Connie caught on. Okay, she said, but you're taking it to go. Max got all excited as Connie grabbed a paper cup out of the pantry and began setting up his drink. As she worked, she glanced over at him. Now come on, spill it. What else you got? Piper wants to see you, Max explained eagerly. There's a situation that requires your attention. Both Connie and Madison exchanged a concerned look upon hearing this news. Connie wrapped up Max's drink and handed it over to him, nodding in understanding. Where is she? Connie asked. Cafe getting some food, Max replied. Okay, tell her we'll be right there, Connie responded. Max nodded enthusiastically and hoisted his cup up in the air to toast them as he left. Once Max had gone... Connie turned to Madison with a worried expression. Almost afraid to ask what this can be, she muttered. Madison wore a similar look of apprehension. Let's just hope we don't have to have that conversation with her this morning. Connie gave her friend an anxious glance as they headed off to get ready. The vague possibility of impending doom hanging over them both as they prepared themselves for whatever chaos the day had in store. Chapter 3 Madison and Connie strolled through the town, their fellow survivors nodding and smiling in appreciation. Connie had become a symbol of hope, having saved many lives and brought them all to this place. Madison, while contributing significantly, preferred to let Connie take the role of a figurehead. Not to be that person, Madison began. But if we keep bringing all these people here, we're going to have to have a serious talk about the food situation especially with winter just around the corner. Connie sighed, her plate already overflowing with responsibilities. I know, I'm supposed to have a meeting with Mayor Williams about that this morning. She checked her watch and shook her head, letting out another sigh. Actually, I'm supposed to be meeting with him right now about it. He knows you're important, Madison reassured her. He'll wait. Besides, it's not like the impending starvation of everybody in town issue is going away in the next hour or so. Connie glanced at Madison, who sported a sly grin, hoping her dark humor would lighten the mood. Not sure that's helpful, Connie replied. Well, you're less worried about what Piper has to say, 
Madison quipped. So I'd say I'm doing a pretty good job as your unofficial advisor. Oh, so you're unofficial now, huh? Connie teased. Well, if I'm official, that would mean the starving people would have two names to curse, Madison quipped. Just doing my part to help them conserve energy by only having one name to curse. Connie couldn't help but break into laughter at the absurdity of Madison's words. You sure you weren't a politician before the world went to hell? Far from it, Madison replied with a mysterious smile. Are you ever going to tell me what you did back in those days? Connie inquired. When the time's right, Madison evaded. Okay, should I start a pool going? Connie joked. Winner gets the next coffee container. If you do, just know that I'll be taking offers from people on their cut of the caffeinated gold. Madison playfully countered. Wouldn't be hard to come out on top with me in their corner. Oh, you'd be banished to your room, for sure. Connie teased. Hey now, you can't do that to your advisor, Madison protested. Unofficial advisor, Connie corrected. As far as everyone else knows, you're just my roommate. Madison paused and thought for a moment, realizing she had painted herself into a corner. She let out a chuckle and shook her head. Now who's the politician? Connie responded with a sly smile as they approached a small cafe on Main Street. It stood on the corner, seemingly untouched since its construction in the 1960s, a relic well-maintained but with limited food supplies. Inside, a handful of people were sitting around dipping bread into soup, while a lucky few had a meager portion of scrambled eggs on their plates. In the back corner, Piper, a former soldier with short, spiky blonde hair, sat alone at a table. She winced from the tightness in her shoulder, uncertain if it was from her recent adventure, the latest injury, or accumulated wounds from years past. Piper quickly brushed off her discomfort upon spotting Connie and Madison. She waved them over and, before they could sit down, blurted out, We have a serious problem. Connie glanced at Madison, who chuckled and shook her head. Good morning to you too, Piper. Guess it's too much to ask for someone to bring me good news for a change, Connie added. Piper's serious demeanor softened as she saw the stress on Connie's face. She nodded, acknowledging that she might have come on too strong. Sorry, Connie. It's just not something that can wait. Is it more important than securing food? Connie motioned toward the room and the meager offerings because I don't have to tell you how much morale drops when rations run out. Sorry, it's just, I've been on horseback the last six hours, and I'm a little out of practice, Piper explained. It's been a long, painful night. It's okay, Piper, so tell me what's going on, Connie said. Piper began. There's this town called Hutchinson, about 60 miles southeast of here. There are survivors there, and they're having a hell of a time. How many survivors? Madison inquired. I didn't get a full count, but a few hundred, Piper replied. Connie's eyes widened, and she shook her head. I don't care what's going on there. We don't have the resources to help them out. Piper hesitated for a moment, then continued. I haven't even told you what the issue is. I mean, we don't have food to give them. Our weapon situation is dire, to put it mildly, so I'm not sure what problem they're going to have that we can help them with, Connie explained. Piper's frustration built up, and she slammed her hand on the table with force, bringing everyone's conversations to a halt. She pointed directly at Connie, her voice low and forceful. Well, we need to figure something out because they're staring down the barrel of a mob of zombies shambling towards them. How many? Madison asked. Piper shook her head. It was dark, so I didn't get the best look. But it wouldn't surprise me if it was a thousand. Jesus, Madison muttered. I'm sorry, Piper, but I have no idea how we'd be able to help, Connie admitted. Do they not have fortifications and weapons down there? Some, but the survivors there are mostly older farmers, Piper explained. Looks like the military cleared the town out when they took over and left it abandoned. 
So they moved in because they figured there was safety in numbers. If they're farmers, that could go a long way towards solving our food situation, Madison pointed out. Yeah, but what are we supposed to do against a thousand of those things? Hell, I'm not sure we could handle half that number here, Connie pondered. We do have that barbed wire that came in today, Madison suggested. What the hell are we going to be able to do with that? Connie asked. If we make it thick enough, it should slow them down enough that we can do some damage to them with whatever weapons we can dig up, Madison replied. Connie took a moment to reflect, her eyes filled with uncertainty, before finally nodding in agreement. Her voice, like a soft whisper in the wind, held a hint of reluctance. Not my favorite idea, but I think it could work if we have enough time to implement it, Connie admitted, her words laced with apprehension. Madison, her face etched with concern, turned to Piper, seeking information that weighed heavily on their fate. Piper, where are the zombies now? Madison inquired, her voice tinged with urgency. Piper's response was delivered with a sense of impending dread, her eyes mirroring the grim reality of their situation. When I left last night, they were about 40 miles out and shambling up the highway towards the town. It's a straight shot for them, Piper replied, her words painting a vivid picture of impending doom. Connie, never one to back down from a challenge, considered their options and posed a risky question. Can we distract them away from the town? Connie wondered aloud, her voice carrying a hint of desperation. Not without risking something far worse, Piper cautioned, her tone somber. Connie's eyes squeezed shut briefly as she processed the dire circumstances they faced. Sorry, Piper. Maybe it's the lack of caffeine. But I feel like I've missed something, Connie confessed, her exhaustion evident. Piper continued. This town is 50 miles or so away from Wichita, which despite the military's best effort is starting to empty, Piper explained, her words resonating with an air of foreboding. Connie and Madison exchanged concerned glances, realizing the gravity of their situation. Relax. The main barricades are holding firm, but a few of the smaller barricades are failing now that they're unmanned, which makes that area to the north of town a little dangerous. Those things are scattered all over the countryside. If we start blaring music or setting off explosions to pull those things away from town, we might have a fight on our hands that we can't win. Piper elaborated. Connie's doubts persisted, her belief in their chances waning. Still not convinced we can win this one, Connie admitted, her voice tinged with resignation. Madison, however, clung to hope like a lifeline. I think we should try, though, Madison asserted, her words injecting a glimmer of optimism into their bleak reality. I think you're right, Connie agreed, her voice softening as she weighed their options. Piper interjected with a final, ominous revelation. There's one other thing, Piper began, her words heavy with a burden she couldn't escape. Oh, Lord, Connie murmured, anticipating yet another layer of complexity to their predicament. When I was leaving town last night, I spotted a patrol, Piper revealed, her voice laced with concern. Connie and Madison exchanged worried glances, realizing the implications. A patrol? Connie questioned, her voice filled with apprehension. Military patrol. I think our rivals know who's in that town and might be making a play for them, Piper explained, her words carrying a weight that sent shivers down their spines. They already outman and outgun us. If they have the food, Madison added, her tone resolute. Yeah, we're boned. I know, Connie conceded her voice heavy with resignation. But they needed more information to plan their next move. Connie turned her attention back to Piper, seeking clarity. How big of a contingent was it? Connie inquired, her voice tinged with concern. Just saw the one vehicle, Piper replied, her voice holding a glimmer of hope. Madison pondered the situation, her mind racing through the possibilities. Scouting party? Madison suggested, her voice filled with uncertainty. 
Let's hope so, because I think that's the only break we're getting today, Connie declared, her voice tinged with determination. So, we're going to help them, Piper asked, her voice filled with hope. We will. You did good, Piper. Go get some rest, Connie ordered, acknowledging Piper's invaluable contribution. I'm coming with you, Piper insisted, her determination shining through. Connie hesitated, searching for the right words to convey her concerns. It's just... Connie began, her voice trailing off. You don't think I have it in me to pull the trigger on people I shared a uniform with, do you? Piper questioned, her tone unwavering. Connie was caught off guard, uncertain of how to respond. The silence hung in the air, but Piper continued, her resolve unshaken. Let me tell you something, Connie. These motherfuckers left me for dead. And now they're not only still trying to kill me and everyone who took me in, but they're doing horrific things to civilians. How many people have come into town who were shell-shocked from their experiences with them? Too many. That's how many. I don't know if I have 40 years or 40 hours left on this rock, but I guarantee that in whatever time I have left, I will put down each and every one of those motherfuckers who crosses my path. Now, do what you gotta do, because we have to hit the road. We have a town full of folks who need help, Piper declared, her words echoing with a fierce determination. Piper punctuated her statement with a resounding smack on the table before exiting the cafe, leaving everyone in stunned silence. Madison finally broke the tension. Well, at least we got an answer on that, Madison quipped, trying to inject a note of levity. Yep, Connie agreed, her voice carrying a mix of emotions. So, what's the play? Madison inquired, her voice laced with curiosity. The three of us are going to load up all that barbed wire and head down to Hutchinson, Connie explained, her voice resolute. No, you're not going anywhere, Madison protested, her tone firm. Madison, I wasn't asking for your opinion. The three of us are going, Connie asserted, her tone unwavering. Connie, you are too important to the... Madison began, her voice filled with concern. But Connie cut her off. To the what? To the town. You're right, I am. And right now, this town needs food. If we do manage to save those people, I need to be the one to convince them to join us against the military. Connie explained. And we can bring you down there once it's safe. I can take Max and Zayden with me. Madison suggested, her voice filled with concern. No, they stay here. Zayden is unproven in a fight, and Max is doing wonders with the defenses here. I don't want that to stop, Connie insisted. Okay, the three of us it is then, Madison agreed, her tone resigned. As they finalized their plans, Madison's thoughts drifted, lost in contemplation. What is it? Connie inquired, noticing Madison's distant expression. Do you want to win your pool? Madison asked, a hint of mischief in her voice. Connie, puzzled by the question, nodded in acknowledgement. Madison motioned for her to follow, and they left the cafe, making their way to the residential area. They stopped in front of a dilapidated one-story house that appeared abandoned. So you were in house restoration, Connie inquired. Her curiosity peaked. Madison led her to the back of the house, where a storm cellar awaited. However, it was no ordinary storm cellar. A heavy-duty metal door with a digital keypad guarded its entrance. Madison entered a ten-digit code, and the door clicked open. Connie's eyes widened in astonishment, and she regarded Madison with newfound respect. Come on, you haven't seen anything yet, Madison teased, a faint smirk on her lips. Together, they descended into the cellar, and as the door closed behind them, the interior lights flickered to life, revealing a hidden bunker. The walls were lined with weapons, boxes of rations, papers, maps, and a computer, all powered on. Connie stood in awe, feeling as if she had stepped into a world straight out of a spy novel. I need you to start talking, 
Connie urged, her voice filled with anticipation. We don't have a lot of time, Madison began, her tone serious. Connie pressed for more information. Make it, she demanded. Madison finally revealed the truth. I'm a government agent, Madison confessed, her voice carrying a weighty secret. Well, yeah, I kind of assumed that. But why here? Connie inquired, her curiosity deepening. I was stationed near Kansas City when all this kicked off. Got stuck in a condo high-rise with a high-value asset. The group of soldiers that came to rescue us are some of the same ones who went rogue. My handler ordered me to stay put, blend in, and keep an eye on them. I've been filing reports. Ever since we got moved in here, Madison explained, her voice laden with a sense of duty. Connie's anger simmered just beneath the surface. You knew what was going on, and you didn't say anything. Connie questioned, her voice tinged with frustration. I've shared every bit of information I have. That's the truth, Madison asserted, her voice sincere. Why not tell us then? And why tell me now? Connie pressed, seeking clarity. Madison pointed to a large wooden crate on a nearby table, her intentions clear. After what the military did, coming in and taking over only to pull out and leave behind some bad apples, I figured my job would be exponentially more difficult if people thought I was a Fed rather than just a state lackey. And as far as telling you now, Madison trailed off, leaving the sentence hanging. Connie followed Madison's gesture and approached the wooden crate. When she opened it, she found boxes upon boxes of shotgun shells. This might just give us a fighting chance down there, Connie remarked, her tone a mix of determination and gratitude. I've seen you in action with that gun of yours. God help those military boys if they try and mess with you, Madison quipped, her voice filled with confidence. There's an awful lot of stuff in here that can help this town out, Madison, Connie noted, her voice tinged with appreciation. And if things start going south, you have my word that I'll open up the vault. But right now, I need your word that you'll keep it just between us, Madison requested, her voice earnest. You know we're going to have to tell Piper, right? Connie pointed out. Madison's gaze fell upon a collection of black assault rifles hanging on the wall, and she recognized the truth in Connie's words. Because when we give this to her, she's going to want to know where it came from, Connie clarified. Good point, but that's it. Nobody else knows, Madison affirmed. Connie sealed the pact. You got a deal. Come on. We have a town to save, Connie declared. Chapter 4 Piper's voice sliced through the crisp air, her disbelief evident as she demanded, What the hell do you mean you're a federal agent? The highway stretched ahead and Connie skillfully guided the truck towards Hutchinson. In response to Piper's incredulous question, Madison maintained a calm demeanor, not sure what's unclear. Piper's eyes narrowed, suspicion tainting her tone. What the hell are you doing here is a good start. Madison explained patiently, I'm here to help with the military deserter problem. Piper's response was laced with bitterness. Oh, a deserter like me? What? You going to report me for a court-martial? Madison dismissed such concerns. Nothing like that. I figure they tried to liquidate you, so you get a pass. Piper nodded, a defiant spark in her eyes. Damn right I do. Madison continued. No. My orders are to keep tabs on the deserters causing trouble and setting up shop. And besides, if I was after you, do you really think I'd give you such a shiny new killing machine? Piper's lips curled into a wry smile. Yeah, you're right. Plus, you're smart enough to not get in a fight with me. Madison cast a quick glance at Connie, who joined in with a chuckle. Madison simply nodded in agreement. You got me there. As the journey continued, a road sign announced their approach to Hutchinson with a simple message. Hutchinson, two miles. Piper took charge, her voice commanding. Okay, when we get there, you let me do the talking and introductions. 
The leader's name is Solomon. Good guy, not exactly trusting of outsiders. Especially military and especially not federal agents. So let's keep that under wraps. Madison assured her. Lips are sealed. The group reached the northern side of the town, where two cars obstructed the road. Two young guards, no older than 15, brandished shotguns. Piper directed Connie, just pull up and roll your window down. Connie followed the instructions, keeping a vigilant eye on the young guards as Piper leaned over her to roll down the window. One of the teenage guards challenged them. What do you want? Piper, with unwavering authority, declared, Tell Solomon that Piper is back and she's brought friends. The teenage guard resisted, retorting, I don't take orders from you. Piper, her tone growing menacing, didn't back down. You either get Solomon on the radio, or so help me God. I'm going to get out of this truck, smack you upside the head, drag you into the center of town, pull down your pants, and beat your ass in front of God and country until it's redder than an apple. The young man found himself torn between confusion and a strange blend of fear and admiration. The women in the truck recognized the dilemma he faced. Piper quickly realized her mistake. Shit. Madison couldn't resist a tease. You may want to rephrase that. Piper hastily corrected herself, her tone still firm. Scratch that. You either get Solomon on the radio, or I will shove that shotgun where the sun don't shine. This time, the teenage guard's face showed no confusion. He immediately nodded and pulled out the radio. Piper leaned back into her middle seat releasing a sigh of relief. That was close. Madison couldn't help but chuckle. Yeah, you threatened to make that boy a man in front of the entire town. Oh, shut up, Piper retorted. Madison and Connie laughed, but they soon noticed the teenage guard waving at them, trying to regain their attention. He spoke timidly. He's in the town square. You can go through. Piper playfully winked at the boy as Connie drove around the barricade and into the town. As they traversed the small town, the aftermath of military occupation became evident. Emptied stores, shattered windows, and makeshift fortifications on side streets leading out of town. Most of the civilians guarding these posts were either too young or too old to be conscripted by the military. The trio continued their journey into the nearly deserted town. Dozens of people peered from behind storefront windows, curious about the newcomers. The biting winter morning discouraged most from venturing outside, but the conditions within the buildings seemed equally inhospitable. Madison expressed her concern. There's no way we're going to be able to protect this town on our own. We have to hope there are some able-bodied people hiding in there. Connie offered assurance. Don't let their age fool you. These old farmers are tough as nails. Madison acknowledged their resilience. I don't doubt that. Pretty sure they're salty too, but that's not going to matter much when it comes to fighting off a horde. Piper chimed in confidently. It's a good thing we brought along an arsenal then. She gestured to the bags of ammo and weaponry in the back of the truck. The truck pulled up to a large building with towering windows where people pressed against the glass to catch a glimpse of the newcomers. An older man, Solomon, emerged, his appearance contrasting with his leadership. In his 70s, with a mane of white hair, a scruffy white beard, and a wiry frame, he approached them on the sidewalk. There he is, Piper said, pointing towards Solomon. Connie couldn't hide her surprise. That's the leader. He's like a sapling in a pair of overalls. Piper defended him. He's worked in the fields since he was 12, so he's tougher than he looks. Connie smirked. Not exactly a high bar to clear there. Come on, time's not on our side, Piper said. The three of them approached Solomon, who stood alone on the sidewalk. He assessed the newcomers before giving an approving nod. Piper introduced them. Solomon, I'd like to introduce you to the leaders of our little community. Connie and Madison. Solomon smiled broadly. It's a pleasure. 
And when you said you'd be back in the morning with reinforcements, I doubted you. Looks like I was proven wrong. Well, at least half wrong. Two people doesn't exactly come off as reinforcements. Madison responded with confidence. What we lack in numbers, we more than make up for in skill. Connie added, and firepower. Solomon nodded in agreement, his expression one of hope and determination. My apologies if that came off as unappreciative. We're in a heap of trouble and can use all the help we can get. So we're very thankful that you're here. Connie replied graciously, her tone reassuring. No offense taken, just happy that we're in a position to help. Solomon turned his attention to Connie, displaying a respectful demeanor. Has Miss Piper told you what we're dealing with? Piper, slightly vexed by the Miss Piper address, attempted to correct Solomon, but he raised his hand, shaking his head. I'm sorry, Piper. I have decades of etiquette ingrained on my noggin. I'll try and get it right next time. Piper smiled in acknowledgement, and the focus shifted back to Connie. Connie addressed Solomon's inquiry. She's told us that there's a mob of those things headed your way, and you don't have the firepower or manpower to deal with it. That's about the long and short of it, Solomon replied. Connie delved deeper. Do we know how far out they are? Solomon nodded, revealing a walkie-talkie in his hand. I sent one of the youngsters down the road to keep watch. He calls in every 15 minutes for an update. Based on where they are, we guess we've got a couple of hours at most before they're here. Connie considered their options, her mind already formulating a plan. We can work with that. Have your people been able to get anything on the road to slow them down? Piper asked. Managed to get a few cars on the highway, but that's not going to do much against them. Agreed. A mob that size will shove them out of the way like their toys, Madison added. Connie, lost in thought, was only partially engaged in the conversation. Madison noticed her distraction. You don't agree, Madison asked. Connie finally broke her silence, her mind racing with ideas. The cars on their own aren't going to do much, but we can still use them. How? Madison inquired. Solomon, how many cars do you have out there? Connie asked. Solomon thought for a moment. Nine, I think. We're going to need one more, Connie ordered. I'll get some people to move one up there right away, if you think it'll help. Even if I'm not sure it will, Solomon replied. Connie assured him, trust me. Oh, and make sure they're pushed just off the road, five on each side. There was confusion among the group until Madsen grasped Connie's strategy. So we're forgetting the posts and just going to use the cars then? Connie elaborated, break out the windows, wrap it around the door frames. Might even be able to double up on some of the vehicles if they have four doors. Connie paused, awaiting Madison's opinion. Madison readily agreed. It doesn't involve digging holes. So I'm in. Connie smiled. Good. I want you to head that project up. Solomon, do you have some able-bodied people who know their way around barbed wire? Solomon nodded, offering assistance. Yes, ma'am. If you want to go into the building behind me and get the Anderson brothers and tell them what you need, they'll get you set straight. Madison grabbed a radio as she left, holding it up for them to see. I'm on channel three, she says as she walks away. Updates every 15 minutes, Connie ordered. Madison nods as she heads into the store. What do you want me to do? Piper asked eager to get going. I want you to scour this town for every drop of flammable liquid you can find, Connie instructed. Solomon cuts in, afraid that's going to be a tall order, ma'am. Those military boys took every drop of fuel and alcohol for that matter. Pharmacy got raided too, so rubbing alcohol in all that's gone. What about your vehicles? Anything left there? Piper asks. Solomon shakes his head. The ones that still had fuel in them, we sent out of town with our most vulnerable. Young children and the like. Even if they could come back, they have orders not to. Solomon replied. 
Connie refocused her attention on Solomon. What else is plentiful and flammable? A lot of beauty supplies can light up in a hurry. Nail polish remover, stuff like that, Piper suggested. Connie teased Piper playfully. You didn't strike me as the beauty queen type. Piper explained with a smirk. Oh, I'm not. I was just a kid who liked to burn things on a budget. Couldn't buy a bottle of whiskey when I was 12. But I sure could get that cheap polish remover. Connie laughed, a childhood well spent. Okay, Solomon, is there a drugstore nearby? Couple blocks down on the right corner. Grocery stores three more blocks up after that, Solomon replied. Connie issued orders. Get everything you can find. Need some glass bottles and rags too. Not my first Molotov, Piper responded in a flippant manner. Connie nodded at Piper, appreciating her experience. Fair enough. Meet back here when you have it. Piper headed off towards the drugstore, and Solomon remained, willing to assist further. What else you need, ma'am? For starters, need you to drop the formalities. Connie is fine. Okay, you got it, Connie. What else? Solomon said. Is there a hardware store in town? Used to be. Military cleared it out of everything. Well, everything useful, that is. About the only thing left in there are snow shovels. They're thorough. I'll give them that. Connie said, with a hint of admiration in her foes. So, you think you're going to be able to help us, Connie? Solomon inquired. I think we're going to give it everything we got, Solomon. I appreciate that more than you know, Connie. But can I ask you something else? Go for it, Connie replied. Then what? Solomon asked simply. What do you mean? Connie replied. I mean, what are we supposed to do? We're not exactly a fighting force. It's only a matter of time before those military rabble-rousers come around, Solomon replied. I'm going to level with you, Solomon. I don't have all the answers, and I certainly don't have the provisions to take in such a large number of people. That said, if you and yours want to get back to a farm life after we survive the day, I'm confident that we can work out an agreement that's beneficial to us both. Connie, I've been in the fields my entire life, and I'd prefer to keep it that way. You get us through the day, and you'll have yourself some farmers, Solomon replied enthusiastically. Connie extended her hand for Solomon to shake, sealing their understanding. First things first, though, we gotta get through the day. Solomon agreed. Yes, Connie. Now you just tell me what you need, and I'll make it happen. Connie addressed another concern. Piper said there was a military patrol near here last night. Do you know where? There's a hilltop about half a mile outside of town to the southeast gives a real nice overlook of the highway leading into town. They parked up there last night, Solomon replied. Connie asked the crucial question, they still there? Solomon replied, last time I checked, I put Arlo on the job keeping an eye on them. As long as that old fool didn't doze off, we should have eyes on them. Connie decided on their next move. Let me grab something out of the truck, and we'll head his way. Connie retrieved her shotgun and a handful of shells from the truck before she and Solomon set off to find Arlo. Chapter 5 Inside the sturdy four-wheel drive vehicle, the atmosphere was tense. Sergeant Cook occupied the driver's seat, while a disgruntled Private Morgan sat in the passenger seat. It had been a long and uncomfortable night for these two adversaries, forced to share a confined space on the orders of Captain Bennett. Sergeant Cook peered through a pair of binoculars, fixated on the highway ahead. His gaze was focused on Madison and a group of older gentlemen who were diligently securing barbed wire to the rows of cars lining both sides of the highway. They've been at that for nearly an hour now, Cook remarked, his voice tinged with curiosity. I wonder if they know something we don't. Private Morgan, seated beside him, couldn't resist a snide comment. With you in the car, that's probably a safe bet. Cook bristled at Morgan's remark. Watch yourself, private. Morgan wasn't one to back down easily, 
Or what? Cook, you gonna reprimand me? You gonna report me to Bennett? I'll do what I have to do, Cook responded sternly. Morgan, however, seemed undeterred. Bitch, do you think rank still matters out here in all this? To some of us, it does. Private, Cook replied, his voice firm. Nah, just to you, Cook. Just to you, Morgan retorted. I bet Captain Bennett would disagree, Cook remarked, trying to assert his authority. Morgan burst into laughter, shaking his head. If ignorance is bliss, then you must be orgasmic. Cook shot Morgan a piercing glare, but Morgan showed no signs of backing down. You can get pissy at me all you want. It doesn't change reality, bud. Morgan continued his taunting. Ask yourself, if you're as high up this food chain as you think you are, then why have you spent the last week sitting in a podunk town doing shit that's beneath me? Work needs to get done, and I'm getting it done, Cook insisted, his confidence waning. Morgan wasn't finished. Yeah, with a few hundred civilians who were already pacified. And you couldn't even do that without getting complaints from the men. We're in a war for survival, and you're out here with a bleeding heart. And now your ass is out here with me on a scouting mission. Guess the captain wanted me to keep an eye on you, Cook admitted, his doubts growing. Morgan's laughter deepened, causing Cook to second-guess himself. What if Captain Bennett had indeed lost faith in him? What if his initial goodwill had finally run out? Cook tried to refocus on the task at hand. They had intelligence suggesting that a group of farmers had fled to this small town. But what if there was a hidden agenda? What if Morgan was being groomed to take over his role, or worse, to eliminate him? Cook shook his head attempting to dispel these unsettling thoughts. He believed that the captain valued his ability to connect with people on a level beyond fear and brute force, or so he hoped. As Cook struggled to regain his focus, Morgan tapped him urgently on the arm. Startled, Cook turned to him asking, What? Morgan continued to tap his arm, more urgently this time, but he remained silent, forcing Cook to drop the binoculars and look at him. Morgan put a finger to his lips, signaling for silence. The mocking demeanor had vanished from Morgan's eyes, replaced by a genuine alertness. Their eyes locked, and Morgan pointed to the back passenger side of the vehicle, indicating the presence of a hostile. Cook checked the side mirror, glimpsing a crouched figure and the barrel of a gun barely visible from behind the corner. They continued their silent communication with Cook motioning for Morgan to cautiously exit the vehicle for investigation while he planned to flank from the driver's side. Morgan made a throat-slitting gesture, but Cook shook his head, conveying their intent to interrogate their visitor. Morgan reluctantly agreed. Cook kept his focus on the rear corner, drawing his handgun and aiming through the back window to cover Morgan as he exited the vehicle. The door opened slowly, and Morgan stepped out, swiftly raising his weapon toward the corner of the vehicle. As he took a single step forward, the knee and the gun barrel vanished from sight. Before Cook could exit the vehicle, he froze. Connie stood a few feet away from the window, her shotgun aimed directly at his head. She spoke in a low, measured tone. Howdy, neighbor. Cook let out a sigh of resignation as he slowly raised his hands where she could see them. Meanwhile, Morgan stood ready to engage not bothering to check if Cook was in position. He simply executed the plan. All right there, mystery guest. Morgan addressed the hidden threat. You need to drop that gun and come out before you get yourself hurt. Connie's response was just as defiant. That's funny. I was about to say the same thing to you. Morgan's head snapped around, spotting Connie through the vehicle's windows. Her shotgun menacingly aimed at Cook's head. Now drop your gun, or else your friend here is going to lose his head, Connie threatened. Morgan couldn't care less about Cook's fate. You think I give a shit about him? Piper's voice chimed in from behind them. No, but I do think you give a shit about your own balls. Morgan looked back at the corner of the vehicle where Piper had emerged, her rifle trained directly at his groin. 
Now do as you're asked before I disarm you permanently, Piper warned. Damn it, Morgan muttered in defeat. He released his handgun and kicked it over toward Piper, who picked it up while maintaining her distance. I'm going to say this to you once, Piper said, drawing her handgun and swinging her rifle over her shoulder. If you try anything, I will shoot you. Not in the head, not in the gut, but in places where you'll wish I shot you in the head. Understand me. Yeah, yeah, I'll be a good boy, Morgan replied begrudgingly. Piper retrieved a set of handcuffs and motioned for Morgan to turn around for her to apply them. As she reached for his arm, Morgan attempted to overpower her by swinging his arm downward and trying to spin around. However, Piper swiftly reacted, squeezing the trigger and sending a round into his kneecap, causing him to collapse in agony. I tried to tell you, Piper said, standing over the wounded Morgan. Morgan writhed in pain on the ground as Connie, shotgun in hand, approached Cook from behind. What the hell's going on over here? Connie inquired. Piper explained as she handcuffed the injured Morgan. I told him that if he played nice, I'll play nice. He didn't play nice. Yeah, he's hard-headed like that, Cook remarked. Connie took charge. You want to secure him, and I'll call it in. Piper assumed responsibility. I'll handle it. Cook stepped forward, hands raised in a sign of cooperation. Don't worry. I play nice. Piper couldn't help but smirk as she turned Cook around and handcuffed him securely. On the other side of the vehicle, Connie pulled out a walkie-talkie. Solomon, do you copy? Connie radioed in. Solomon's voice crackled through the walkie-talkie. I'm here, Connie. Is everything okay? Connie responded took care of your voyeur problem. How are we looking with the fortifications? Solomon replied, Madison said they're getting there, but that horde is getting real close. Okay, we'll be back soon, Connie acknowledged, pocketing the walkie-talkie. She then glanced into the cab of the vehicle, spotting a pair of binoculars. She grabbed them and scanned down the highway, noticing the front edge of the approaching horde. Shit. Connie muttered to herself. She quickly returned to the prisoners, finding that Piper had both Cook and Morgan handcuffed and sitting against the vehicle. How are we looking? Piper asked. Connie handed the binoculars to Piper and motioned toward the road. Piper took them and saw the approaching horde. We've got to move, Connie stated, her concern evident. Kneeling down beside Cook, Connie asked, What's your name? I'm Sergeant Cook. This is Private Morgan, Cook replied. Okay, Sergeant, Connie began, her tone serious. I'm going to give you two choices. You can either get in the back here and stay quiet until we get to town, or I can pop you in the head right now and be done with it. Now, I'd much prefer to be adults about this and have a chat with you, but as you can see by the mob of creatures shambling our way, We have some things to attend to before that can happen. So, what's it going to be? You feel like a nice chat later, or are you ready to check out of the apocalypse for good? Cook maintained his composure and even attempted some humor, saying, I have some nice tea in my bag in the back. You bring the hot water when you're ready? Connie chuckled briefly. Good boy. With that, Connie stepped back and helped Cook to his feet. The two women loaded their prisoners into the back of the vehicle before starting it up and tearing down the hill towards town for an interrogation and a confrontation with a horde. Chapter 6 Madison, Connie, and Piper stood on the highway, positioned about 20 yards behind the final row of barbed wire traps. Solomon, accompanied by a trio of older teenage boys, joined them, clutching bats and various blunt instruments. The women were heavily armed, with Connie meticulously loading her shotgun, while Piper and Madison checked their assault rifles' magazines, preparing them for the impending clash. The young teenagers, wide-eyed and fearful, kept their gazes locked onto the approaching horde of moaning, wretched ghouls. Despite their own anxiety, Solomon attempted to maintain a stern expression to bolster the youngsters' morale. 
one of the teenagers voiced the question on everyone's mind. How in the hell are we going to be able to fight that? Solomon, though inwardly uncertain, outwardly projected confidence. Steady yourselves. This plan is going to work just fine. All you have to do is listen to Connie here. However, Solomon's wavering conviction didn't go unnoticed by Connie. She stepped forward to reassure the group, saying, Solomon is right. If you follow my instructions to the letter, we'll be just fine. The young man, still trembling with nerves, nodded in agreement and retreated into contemplation. Piper couldn't help but ask, do we have enough ammo to clear them with bullets? Madison grimly shook her head. We should manage to take out about a third of them, assuming our estimate of their numbers holds. Piper replied, let's hope I overestimated their count. All eyes remained fixed on the approaching horde as it reached the forefront of the barbed wire traps. The wires stretched eight rows back and forth across the street, with doubled rows a couple of feet apart near the car's doors. Five such barricades lined the highway, leading all the way back to the survivor's position. Connie assumed command of the situation, addressing the group with unwavering determination. All right, listen up, because it's game time. Madison and Piper will position themselves on the cars, flanking us, to thin out the horde and buy us some precious time. I'll be right in the thick of things with you three, providing cover. When those things press up against the barbed wire, that's your cue to start smashing skulls. If you find yourselves overwhelmed or if one of those things grabs your weapon, call out immediately, and I'll be right there. Any questions? Solomon, the elder statesman among them, raised his hand. Just one question. What's my role in all this? Connie clarified, You're our eyes, Solomon. We'll be focused on the fight, so your job is to keep a vigilant watch on the line. If any of those things get through or if the barbed wire starts giving way, you call it out. I want us to be behind the next line of defense before the one they're pressed against collapses. Can you handle that? Solomon affirmed with a steady voice, I may be old, but my vision is sharp. Good, Connie acknowledged. That's the plan then. Let's get into position because those things won't wait around. The group nodded in unison and moved into their designated spots. Piper picked up a small box of Molotov cocktails she had prepared. Connie led them forward along the highway, ensuring that each person understood the height of the barbed wire so they could safely duck beneath it. The last thing they needed was for someone to become entangled while escaping the advancing mob. With each step they took, they drew closer to the ghouls, and the incessant moaning grew louder. The creatures could see their potential prey, and their pace quickened, driven by the sight of fresh meat. Their outstretched arms mindlessly reached for their quarry. The barbed wire pierced most of their stomachs, with some sustaining wounds higher up. A few seconds later, the remainder of the horde caught up to them, exerting pressure on the makeshift barricade. Strike now, Connie's voice rang out. The teenagers hesitated at first, two of them delivering half-hearted swings. The first bat struck the side of a zombie's head, fracturing its collarbone, while the other landed harmlessly on the skull's top due to insufficient force. However, one teenager had no qualms. He threw his entire weight behind a powerful swing, splitting open the skull of a middle-aged woman and dropping her lifeless to the ground. Her body slumped over, swaying like freshly hung laundry. Put your strength into it. Strike them hard, Connie urged. The other two teenagers responded, showing improvement on their second attempts. One after the other, skulls cracked, and the creatures fell with relative ease. Meanwhile, Madison and Piper, from their elevated positions, opened fire. They carefully selected their targets and methodically eliminated ghouls, one after another. The fallen bodies created sporadic gaps in the horde, where the stumbling undead tripped over the corpses. However, it wasn't enough to alleviate the mounting pressure on the barbed wire line. As the teenagers continued their efforts to crush skulls, the barbed wire started to buckle under the overwhelming weight of the mob. 
Some of the first creatures that were taken out were sliced in half by the tightly wound barbed wire, pushed through the line by those behind them. As torsos hit the ground with a heavy thud, Solomon noticed that some of the still-living creatures were sharing the same gruesome fate. Solomon's voice pierced through the pandemonium, a desperate plea for survival that resonated in the air. Connie, to your right. Startled, Connie swiveled in the direction of Solomon's frantic call. What met her eyes sent a shiver down her spine. The top half of a grotesque creature lay sprawled on the ground, its dismembered torso crawling menacingly toward one of the teenagers. Without a second's hesitation, Connie raised her weapon and pulled the trigger, the deafening blast tearing through the creature's skull, leaving a grotesque mess in its wake. The line is breaking. Solomon's words rang out like an ominous prophecy. Connie's eyes darted around, taking in the nightmarish tableau. Only a meager dozen or so ghouls lay vanquished on the ground, a pitiful testament to their desperate struggle. Panic clawed at the edges of her mind as she realized they weren't making even a dent in the relentless horde that loomed ever closer. Connie deftly loaded more shells into her shotgun. Just as the first line of defense faltered, she unleashed a rapid volley of shots, each resounding blast marking another death knell for the ghouls. It was an unrelenting barrage, the shotgun's thunderous roar echoing through the air, creating a macabre symphony. A grisly pile of ghouls tumbled to the ground, their putrid bodies entangled like a heap of rotted flesh and bone. Before Connie could contemplate her next move, she witnessed heads exploding in a gruesome display as Piper opened fire from her elevated vantage point, buying them a few precious moments to regroup. Get to the next line. Piper's command cut through the chaos like a lifeline. Connie nodded and moved with an urgency born of desperation, swiftly reloading her shotgun. Meanwhile, Piper expended the last rounds from her magazine before igniting a Molotov cocktail and hurling it into the heart of the advancing mob. The glass shattered upon impact, splashing flaming liquid over the grotesque figures, setting a dozen or so creatures ablaze in a fleeting inferno. Damn it. Hoped that was going to be more effective, Piper muttered, her frustration palpable. Piper hastily inserted another magazine before joining Madison in their retreat. The two women leaped down from their makeshift perch on the car and sprinted toward the next barricade a few yards away. Both of them clambered onto it, weapons poised and ready for the impending onslaught. Madison voiced the stark reality of their dire situation. Not really hitting the numbers we need to, Connie. Connie's eyes scanned the relentless horde, her mind racing for solutions. I'm open to suggestions. Madison and Piper exchanged glances, their faces etched with uncertainty. Time was a precious commodity they could ill afford as the mob closed in on their position. They began firing with abandon, less concerned with conserving ammunition, and more focused on thinning the approaching horde. Connie emptied another eight shells into the relentless mass, creating a brief breach that was quickly filled by the encroaching ghouls. Bodies on the ground disappeared beneath the tidal wave of flesh, reminiscent of the ocean reclaiming a hole dug into the sand. As she reloaded, the horde reached the line of defense, and the teenagers swung their weapons with frantic desperation. Panic and adrenaline drove them to a frenzied fervor, their blows landing with brutal force. Despite their valiant efforts, the second line of defense proved as futile as the first buckling beneath the weight of the relentless horde's advance. We gotta move, Connie shouted, her voice laced with urgency. Everyone unleashed their fury one last time before retreating to the third line. Connie, after expending several more shotgun blasts, joined the others at the barricade, her eyes scanning the sea of ghouls. Piper, Madison, how's it looking? Connie inquired, her voice tinged with concern. The two women squinted at the distant, seemingly endless mob down the highway, their faces reflecting the harsh truth. At the pace we're going, we'd need 40 of these barricades to clear this mob out, Madison lamented. 
Piper expended her magazine before slinging the rifle over her shoulder. She jumped down from the car and dashed across the safe section where the teenagers were bravely holding their ground. Where are you going? Connie questioned, her trust in Piper resolute. I've got an idea. I'll be right back. I need your knife, though, Piper replied. Connie nodded and handed over her knife to Piper, who gathered her remaining magazines and set them on the car's roof near Madison's feet. She tapped Madison on the leg, capturing her attention. Unload everything you have into the center mass. Create a lane if you can, Piper instructed, her eyes filled with purpose. They're just going to fill it right back in, Madison pointed out, her voice tinged with skepticism. That's fine, but the bodies on the ground will help thin them out. Oh, and I need your knife, Piper requested. Madison retrieved her knife from an ankle holster and handed it to Piper, who then turned to Solomon. There any supplies in that safe house of yours? Piper inquired. Nothing significant. Just a few tools and whatnot that we managed to hide from the soldiers. Solomon replied. Tape. Piper pressed further. Should be some there, Solomon confirmed. With everything she needed in her possession, Piper sprinted back toward town, her destination a couple of hundred yards away. Connie didn't have time to ponder Piper's plan. She simply trusted her instincts. Keep the fight up, Connie shouted to the remaining defenders, her voice filled with determination. Connie unloaded another barrage of shotgun blasts as Madison followed her instruction and concentrated her fire on the center of the advancing mob. Just as Madison had suggested, every time they dropped a few of the creatures, more emerged to take their place. However, as the assault continued, Madison noticed the horde was thinning slightly in the middle. Several zombies at the front line were being cut in half by the barbed wire. The teenagers fighting had to adjust, targeting those split bodies first before returning to attack the rest. Finally, after several more moments of intense combat, the structural integrity of the barbed wire faltered, forcing a retreat. As the women reloaded and steeled themselves to continue the fight, Connie observed that the teenage fighters were flagging. They were hunched over in pain, gulping air in heavy breaths. Get behind the next line, Connie commanded. We're good. We can fight, the lead teenager insisted. I know you can, but you need a breather, Connie replied firmly. I don't know what Piper's up to, but I suspect we'll need you at full strength soon enough. Solomon reinforced her judgment. Do as she says, boys. Begrudgingly, the worn-out teens nodded and withdrew behind the final barrier. Madison slammed more shells into her shotgun, taking stock of her dwindling supply with only a couple dozen left in her bag. Piper, I hope you've got something good ready, Connie muttered as she likewise reloaded and resumed blasting any ghoul that drew near. Deprived of the aid of the teenagers' crushing skulls, this defensive line soon collapsed. Connie expended two full loads of ammo blowing zombie heads, apart before the pressure forced her to join the others behind the last barricade. As Madison ejected her empty magazine and reached for a fresh one, she made the mistake of glancing down the road. The sight of several hundred zombies still coming filled her with dismay. Their only hope was that no more seemed to be appearing in the distance. Drawn by the clamor, while there were likely some, they weren't in the same overwhelming numbers. Her assessment was interrupted by hungry moans emanating from the side of the vehicle. Madison whirled to see two zombies almost on top of her. She quickly fired off rounds at nearly point-blank range, then raced to rejoin the group, making their final stand. So what do we do when they break through? Solomon's voice carried a weight of concern. Connie stood there, her mind racing through a series of unpalatable options. While some buildings in town might withstand the remnants of the mob, their weaponry was insufficient for a meaningful defense. Moreover, their current predicament had already drawn the attention of potential reinforcements. Connie's voice quivered with forced confidence as she spoke, outlining their grim strategy. We fall back to the buildings lock them down as best we can, and fight from there. 
Solomon's skeptical expression did little to disguise his doubt. But Connie had no better alternative to offer at that moment. She steeled herself for the impending battle, for it was the only course of action available. The lumbering mob continued its relentless pursuit, pressing against the final barbed wire barricade line. The wire strained against the weight of the lead creatures, puncturing their torsos as they were pushed through. The teenagers strained to alleviate the pressure, but it was a losing battle. In a matter of minutes, the line began to buckle under the immense pressure. Solomon readied himself to give the order to retreat, but Connie preempted him. When that line goes, we fall back. Do not risk trying to attack them, Connie commanded. One of the teenagers protested, a determined fire in his eyes. We can fight. Connie met his gaze and spoke with unwavering authority, and we will, just not now. Metallic snaps and pops resonated from the barbed wire's edges, as its integrity weakened further. Fall back, Connie shouted urgently. Madison, in the nick of time, emptied the final few rounds from her magazine into the front line, buying precious seconds for the others to retreat before the barbed wire finally gave way. She reached for another magazine, realizing it was her last. Madison swapped it out as she retreated down the road, joining the others who were breathless and drained. We gave it a shot, Madison lamented. A teenager questioned, his voice trembling with uncertainty. What are we going to do now? Connie's voice held a resolute determination. We're going back to town, taking shelter in the stores, and mounting a defense from there. Madison shot Connie a skeptical look, her expression conveying the incredulity of the plan. I know, Madison, but it's our only option, Connie responded, attempting to muster confidence in their bleak circumstances. The women's conversation was abruptly interrupted by the sound of honking approaching from behind. They turned to see their truck hurtling toward them, Piper at the wheel. The group scattered as Piper barreled through the horde, plowing into the center mass of the zombies. Bobbies were sent flying in all directions as the large pickup truck penetrated nearly 20 yards deep into the mass of undead before coming to a stop beside the final row of cars on the side of the road. What the hell? Connie exclaimed, bewildered by the unexpected turn of events. A portion of the horde near the truck redirected their attention toward it, while around 20 ghouls continued to advance toward Connie and the others. Solomon asked, a note of panic in his voice. What do we do? Connie made a quick decision. Take the boys and get back to the stores, lock them down, and stay quiet. Solomon inquired, what are you going to do? Madison added, We're going to go get our slightly out of their mind friend. Connie affirmed their ability to handle the situation. Trust us, Solomon. We've got this. Solomon nodded and began herding the teenagers back toward town. A couple of the boys extended their baseball bats toward the women, who gratefully accepted them. Make a play for the cars, Madison asked. Connie nodded. That's our best bet. You carry the bats, and I'll cover us. Madison agreed, and they were about to make a run for it when a piercing whistle came from the midst of the horde. They looked up to see Piper standing in the back of the truck, brandishing several makeshift spears made from knives. Guess we don't need these, Madison remarked. She dropped the bat she was wielding as the two women prepared to enact their strategy. They split up, circling to either side of the road and moving swiftly while firing carefully placed shots. Vaulting onto the roofs of the abandoned vehicles, the pair attained enough height that the grasping zombies below could not reach them, though many outstretched hands still swiped at the air beneath their feet. From her vantage point atop one car, Connie gazed over at Piper standing nonchalantly amidst the sea of undead. She was wearing a foolishly proud grin. You seem very pleased with yourself, Connie called out wryly. Well, we needed to halt their march, and I did that, Piper shrugged, utterly unconcerned about her predicament. Yeah, but now we're surrounded by a tidal wave of these freaks, Madison shouted back.
gesturing at the endless ranks of ghouls encircling them. In response, Piper casually tossed a makeshift spear over to Madison. Examining it, Madison realized it was her own knife, duct taped to the broken shaft of a snow shovel, the handle still attached to the other end. Just like digging out a sidewalk after a storm, only with more brain matter, Piper chuckled, have at it. Madison smirked and shook her head. She selected her first target and plunged the knife into the top of a ghoul's skull, effortlessly pulling it out. Don't suppose you managed to find some ibuprofen when you were getting these made, did you? Because we're going to need it, Madison remarked. Piper replied, No, but one of the teenagers said they had half a bottle of vodka stashed away that we could have. Madison chuckled. Good to know that even in the apocalypse, you can still count on teenagers to have access to hooch. Piper tossed another spear to Connie, who examined it and nodded in approval. She gave it a test drive, efficiently dispatching a ghoul. Her gaze swept over the mob, estimating at least 300 in their immediate vicinity. She let out a sigh. Okay, Piper, will you do me a favor? Connie asked. Piper, her adrenaline-fueled grin still on display, replied, Another one. Sure, whatever you want. Connie's expression softened. Next time, you're going to make a suicide run into the middle of a sea of these things. Can you give me a heads up? Piper contemplated for a moment as she stabbed another zombie in the head. She chuckled and shook her head. I mean, I totally can. But be honest with yourself. Would you really have wanted to know I was going to do this beforehand? Piper countered. Connie chuckled. No, I don't suppose I would. Their conversation punctuated by the gruesome task at hand. The three women continued to dispatch zombies. Piper, in particular, moved at a frenzied pace, her relentless stabbing resembling a demented game of whack-a-mole. The macabre process stretched on for over an hour, a ceaseless cycle of stabbing and waiting for the next wave of creatures to approach. Thanks to their strategic positioning across the street, they managed to minimize the pile of bodies beneath them, reducing their exposure to danger. Finally, Piper delivered the final blow, vanquishing the last ghoul in their immediate vicinity. The three women stood there, wiping sweat from their brows, gazing out at the grisly aftermath on the highway. Piper, panting heavily, was the first to break the silence. Well, look on the bright side. At least we don't have to clean this mess up. Connie cautiously climbed down from the car, ensuring the creatures beneath her were truly lifeless. She spoke as she made her way to solid ground. True, but our day is far from over, Connie remarked. Madison concurred, her eyes focused on the truck surrounded by corpses, some caught in the wheel wells. Yeah, we still need to figure out a way to get these people out of here, Madison added. Connie surveyed the scene thoughtfully. We might need to siphon that gas and find a different vehicle. But first, Madison interjected, we need to have a chat with our soldier friends. Chapter 7 The trio of Connie, Piper, and Madison made their way back into town, their bodies drenched in blood and sweat, a testament to the grueling day they had endured. Despite their exhaustion, their spirits were high, having miraculously survived the day's trials. As they approached the town, Solomon and the teenagers emerged from their shelter, their eyes fixed on the three women sauntering down the road. With each step, the distance between them closed, and soon they stood face to face. Solomon, the relief evident in his voice, spoke first. I'm so glad to see that you're okay. Yeah. It was a piece of cake. Just had to daredevil it a bit, Piper replied with a hint of bravado. We are forever in your debt, Solomon replied. You say that now, but we're going to be putting you to work soon. We are happy to do it, especially if it's doing something we love, Solomon replied. Well, get your people packed up and ready to go. We have something we need to tend to first. Then we'll be figuring out the logistics of getting you out of here, Connie ordered. 
Your guests as they were are still restrained in the department store across the way. I have two of my men watching them like hawks, Solomon said. Thank you, Solomon. We won't be long, Connie replied. Solomon walked away with the teenagers, leaving Piper to communicate with one of the teens through a subtle drinking motion, a reference to the vodka. The teen responded by revealing the bottle, giving her a thumbs up. The trio entered the store, making their way to a room with a table set up. Two soldiers sat there, their handcuffed hands resting on the table, with two guards standing behind them, shotguns in hand. Connie addressed the guards. Thank you guys. We'll take it from here. The guards nodded and exited through the front door, closing it behind them. Connie sat down across from the soldiers, Madison and Piper flanking her. Connie began, Okay, Sergeant Cook, my apologies for the delay. We have nothing but time, Sergeant Cook replied. Connie pressed on. Now, you mind telling us what you were doing up on that hill all night long? Sergeant Cook chuckled slightly, shaking his head. Why don't you tell me? I mean, you didn't ask us who we were, so I assume you have a pretty good idea. You're with the deserters who have been causing so much trouble in these parts. Connie quickly replied. Sergeant Cook admitted, guilty as charged. Connie continued, and you heard there were farmers. Madison placed her hand gently on Connie's shoulder, bringing the chatter to a halt. Morgan couldn't help but let out an amused laugh at Connie's slip-up, leaving her looking puzzled. Damn, that was easy, Private Morgan remarked with a smug grin. Connie frowned, glancing between Madison and Morgan in confusion. What was easy? What are you talking about? Madison sighed, a look of disappointment washing over her face. You just told them who was here, she explained. They didn't know. Confused, Connie looked at Private Morgan, who shrugged and smirked. Connie leaned in and whispered to Madison, You know how to do this sort of thing? Interrogate. Yeah, I've done it once or twice, Madison replied. Connie nodded, giving Madison the reins. Madison sat down directly across from the two soldiers, scrutinizing them. It suddenly dawned on her that these were the same men who had rescued her from Kansas City, a fact they hadn't realized yet. Madison inquired, so tell me about Captain Bennett. Both Morgan and Cook exchanged glances, uncertain of how to respond. How do you know about him? Private Morgan asked. Madison unflinching remarked, you seem shocked that someone who looks like me could know things. Why do you think we're working under him? Sergeant Cook probed. The military is long gone from here. Only people left are deserters. If you weren't working for him, you would have looted the place for supplies, Madison reasoned. Sound observation. I'm just curious as to how you heard the name. I know there's a variety of ways, survivors from the raids, escapees from the towns, but just like to know. Cook said, had a direct run-in with him a few days after this started, Madison said. Recognition flickered in Cook's eyes, realizing he had been with Captain Bennett at that time. Sergeant Cook mused. You're that agent, aren't you? Private Morgan exclaimed. Agent? Yeah, the agent we had to go into Kansas City for, Sergeant Cook added. Private Morgan finally connected the dots, exclaiming, Hell, man. You're right. Sergeant Cook admitted, almost didn't recognize you. Being coated in a few gallons of caked-on blood can transform a girl's appearance, Madison quipped. Sergeant Cook agreed. It sure can. Sergeant Cook continued. But wow, that really opens up another giant can of worms now, doesn't it? What do you mean? Madison inquired. Sergeant Cook probed. Someone of your stature would have surely been moved out of here and on to more important things. I mean, it's not like there's a war on or anything. Now, why would you be here, hanging out with some civilians? Madison evaded, million-dollar question indeed, but not one that's particularly relevant at the moment. Sergeant Cook countered, I disagree, but for the moment, 
I will defer to your line of questioning. Cook stared her down, their eyes locking, trying to get a read on each other. The expression on Cook's face lead her to believe that he was putting the pieces together as to why she's there, which is to keep an eye on them. So we've established that you're with Captain Bennett and that you're out here trying to figure out who's hanging out in town here, Madison remarked, her words laden with curiosity, like a traveler on the verge of unearthing a hidden treasure. But if you're this far out, I'm going to venture a guess and assume you have some significant numbers. More than you know, Agent, Cook mysteriously replied. Madison, undeterred, pressed on, her voice carrying a subtle challenge. Well, why don't you enlighten me? Private Morgan's lips parted, eager to interject. But Piper's swift and cold response silenced him. The metallic click of her handgun resonated like a promise of swift and merciless retribution. Her aim was unwavering, pointing directly at Morgan's lap. Please say another word, Piper cautioned with an icy demeanor. Please, make this the best day ever for me. Just one more word. That's all it will take, Piper added, her tone laced with an eerie calm. Morgan held her gaze briefly before reluctantly turning to Cook, who responded with a smirk and a knowing wink. It was a subtle communication of solidarity, a bond forged in the crucible of shared purpose, and it seemed to ease Morgan's anxiety. Our numbers are vast, Cook finally revealed, his voice resonating with the weight of their collective strength. There's a ton of soldiers who didn't like the fact that we cut and ran as soon as this thing started. And that doesn't even take into account the shit show that Kansas City was. I mean, I don't have to tell you about that. Madison acknowledged their shared ordeal with a nod, her eyes reflecting the haunting memories of that fateful day. No, you do not. Surprised any of us walked away from that clusterfuck. Throw in a healthy amount of civilians, sympathetic to our cause, and all of a sudden we're one hell of a formidable force, Cook replied. Believe me, we've heard stories of just how formidable you are, Madison responded, her words dripping with condemnation. Must take some real balls to gun down elderly civilians and beat people into submission. Cook's eye twitched, revealing the turmoil within him a battle to reconcile his actions with his conscience. Madison, sensing his vulnerability, chose not to push the issue further. So why don't you tell me where your people are? Madison inquired, her voice steady and inquisitive. It'd be easier if I drew it, Cook proposed, his demeanor unruffled. Morgan, on the brink of speaking out, was silenced by Piper's menacing click once more. Madison considered the decision carefully, casting a glance at Connie for her input. Before Connie could respond, Cook added, keep a gun on me if you want. Not going to bother me any. Connie nodded subtly and retrieved a pen from behind the counter. She also produced a map of the state and drew her handgun. Keeping it poised and ready, Madison placed the pen before Cook and he accepted the tool, ready to chart their secrets. There you go, start drawing. Madison instructed, her tone a mix of curiosity and caution. Morgan's frustration simmered beneath the surface as Cook began marking the map. He traced the lines around several mid-sized towns in the eastern part of the state before coming to a pause. In a swift and unexpected motion, Cook transformed the innocuous pen into a weapon, the tip piercing Morgan's jugular vein. The room fell into an eerie silence as Morgan desperately tried to stem the flow of blood, but it was an exercise in futility. Moments later, he slumped over the desk, his life extinguished by the relentless torrent of blood. A heavy, lingering silence pervaded the room as the three women grappled with the shock of the moment. Cook calmly pushed the map aside, ensuring it remained unsoiled by the crimson tide. I'm afraid I'm going to need a new pen, Cook stated coolly. Madison finally found her voice, her fury palpable. What in the holy fucking hell was that? Cook remained unflinching, his tone steady as he explained, that was me taking out the trash. 
Taking out the trash. What are you talking about? Madison demanded, her voice carrying an edge of disbelief. Cook offered clarification. You know all those stories about civilians being brutalized and murdered. He was the worst offender. It was like he got off on their suffering. Madison challenged him with a pointed stare. But not you, huh? No, I fought against it as best I could. But I'm in the extreme minority, Cook confessed. Piper's eyes hardened as she glared at the sergeant. Don't listen to him, she urged the others. Let's just smoke him and get out of here. He's just desperate to save his own skin. Connie nodded, swayed by her friend's argument. I think Piper's right, she agreed. Her voice tinged with anger toward the man who had tricked her. Madison weighed the options, seeming inclined to follow her friend's vengeful plan. But before she could respond, Cook spoke up, his gravelly voice cutting through the tension. Agent, do you remember the conversation we had at the mall just after we rescued you? Cook asked. Madison nodded, recalling the memory with a hint of recognition. He gave me a heads up that there was trouble brewing. Got the sense he was concerned with what was going on. Cook added, I was. Which is why I spoke up. That day we rescued you. I saw Captain Bennett threaten to kill civilians. Obviously, I was hopeful that he was just in shock over the loss of our men that day. But my gut told me otherwise. Which is why I shared my concerns with you. Piper and Connie harbored reservations. Their uncertainty mirrored in hesitant glances. But Madison saw a glimmer of possibility flickering in the depths of her contemplative eyes. Give me a reason to believe you. Madison's voice held a thread of desperation. Sergeant Cook took a deep breath, his gaze distant as he recounted. I'm from Lawrence, Kansas. Spent every day there until I enlisted. The people they're harming. The people they're killing. Those are my people. My friends. Neighbors. And family. The whole reason I ended up as a deserter was because I joined Captain Bennett in fighting back against General Rothman and what he was doing to our people in that field hospital in Spring Hill. Things just spiraled out of control after that. Piper's attention snapped to life at the mention of Spring Hill, and Madison followed suit. Their shared history intertwined with General Rothman. General Rothman was the one who tried to have me killed. Piper's voice dripped with simmering anger. Cook nodded somberly. He was. Once we found out, we stood up against him, decided to go our own way. He better hope he gets transferred to the front line somewhere, because I'm going to hunt his ass down. Piper's resolve was unwavering. We beat you to it. Took him out a few days ago. Cook revealed his words resonating with finality. Sorry you didn't get the opportunity to voice your displeasure personally. As long as he suffered, Piper's response was cold and unyielding. Oh, he did. I can guarantee you that, Cook replied. Cook's confession seemed to earn him Piper's approval, and Madison turned her attention to Connie, who was grappling with her emotions. I just have one question. Connie's voice wavered. Okay, Cook replied. Did you and your men kill my sister? Connie's voice trembled with sorrow and anger. I honestly don't know. Cook's admission hung in the air. After Rothman left, the townsfolk turned their anger towards us. I can say with confidence, though, that we only fired on people who fired on us. But our escape was a blur of bullets and zombies. Connie wasn't thrilled with the answer, but she reluctantly accepted it, her eyes glistening with unshed tears. Okay, Madison, it's your call on how to proceed. Connie deferred to her friend. Madison deliberated for a moment, her expression grave. Here's the deal. I own you now. If you walk out that door, you answer to me. If you don't, I have no problem burning you. Are we clear on that point? Madison's words were laced with authority. Absolutely, Cook agreed. But you can drop the hostility. I know you care about the civilians, just like I do. So we're going to work together. Good, 
Now we're going to have a long chat together before sending you on your way. And you're going to be given a series of dead drops where you're going to drop intel. Madison outlined her terms. I can work with that. But our talk now is going to have to be quick. I'm due back at base by sundown. And I have a hell of a drive ahead of me. Cook explained. Okay, we're going to find you a new pen so you can mark up that map. But give me the bullet points about what we're up against. Madison pressed for information. Cook provided a grim assessment between the former soldiers and the sympathetic civilians. We are at least a thousand strong, and we control a lot of territory. Well, that's not encouraging, Connie remarked. You don't know the half of it. We're not the only deserters out there. We have soldiers stretching out through Oklahoma, Texas, and even into Arizona and Nevada. Turns out that when the military retreated from the bases, they left a lot of toys behind. Cook revealed. Jesus Christ, they're going to roll right over us. Piper's concern was evident. There's still time, because the good stuff is still on those bases. Turns out transporting that stuff is a bitch in the apocalypse, Cook added. How are they planning on bringing it in? Madison inquired. Still debating it at the moment, but we're going to need a big airport. The immediate focus has been on securing the towns and a reliable food and water supply, Cook explained. And how's that going? Madison probed further. Water is secure, still solidifying the food pipeline. But once that's done, the focus will be on fortification and bringing in that weaponry and men. Cook detailed. Do you have a timeline? Madison asked, her tone urgent. A month. Maybe two at the most. Lot of logistics in play, you know, Cook replied. I want every bit of information you can give me on this situation. The airport you're targeting. Where the deserters are. Everything, Madison demanded. It'll take some time, but I can get that information, Cook assured. Just don't take too much time. Madison warned. I won't. But speaking of time, ours is short today, and we still have some things to take care of before I can hit the road, Cook noted. Like what? Madison inquired. Like our deceased friend here, Cook gestured towards the lifeless body. Don't worry. I have a shallow grave I can toss him in, Piper offered. While I would like nothing more, unfortunately, I need to take him with me. Cook revealed. How are you going to explain the pen stabbing? Madison questioned. I'm not going to have to, because you're going to shoot the body up, Cook explained. Oh, that's messed up, Piper remarked. You haven't heard everything yet. I need my vehicle back. We're going to have to put him in the passenger seat and then shoot him through the windshield. Need to make it look like we were attacked while scouting and I bolted. Cook disclosed. That means you're going to have to be in the car when we fire, Madison pointed out. Which is why I'm hoping you're good shots, Cook said. Madison looked over to Connie and Piper, who shrugged and started walking towards the door. I'll bring the car around, Piper offered, their partnership sealed in a pact of grim necessity. Chapter 8 Madison and Piper grappled with the lifeless body of Private Morgan their breaths heavy as they maneuvered him into the passenger side seat. It took some effort, but they eventually secured him in place. Piper's hand reached for the seat belt, but Sergeant Cook halted her with a gesture. He never wore those things, he remarked, his voice low. But he's going to be flopping around, Piper expressed her concern. Cook's response was unexpectedly nonchalant. Good. It'll help sell this illusion. Piper nodded and complied as Cook settled into the driver's seat, fastening his seatbelt. He placed his hands on the steering wheel, taking several deep breaths to mentally prepare for the impending ordeal. Madison interjected, her tone brimming with uncertainty. It's your ass on the line. You tell us how you want us to do this. Cook's voice was firm as he outlined his plan. I need your best shot to take a hunting rifle. Go back about 50 yards and fire through the front windshield. Aim for Morgan's neck so that it gets torn up pretty good. Piper nodded again, taking the weapon from Connie and retreating to her designated spot. 
Meanwhile, Madison engaged in a conversation with Cook, who was still psyching himself up. You sure you're good with this? Madison inquired. Cook's response revealed his resolve. I'm not a fan of live fire coming my way, but I understand the necessity of it. At least I know you're not specifically aiming for me. Madison, trusting Piper's marksmanship, chuckled in response. She returned her attention to Piper, who was now in position. Here we go, Madison announced as she backed away from the vehicle, signaling Piper to proceed. With precision, Piper took aim, steadying herself, and squeezed the trigger. The bullet sliced through the air, tearing through the front windshield and into Morgan's throat. Blood splattered across the interior of the cab, the shattered windshield, and Sergeant Cook, who swiftly wiped it from the side of his face. He also breathed a sigh of relief that he remained unharmed. Madison checked in on him. You good in there? Cook's response carried a hint of humor. Better than I'm about to be. Need you to take that rifle of yours and pump some rounds into the side of the vehicle. His door, shatter his window. Hit him a few times if you can. Then work your way around and hit it a few more times like I'm driving off. Madison hesitated, understanding that Cook didn't need to be inside the vehicle for this part of the ruse. If I don't get some shrapnel and glass in me, they aren't going to buy the story, Cook explained, his voice resolute. Madison nodded and followed his instructions, firing her assault rifle. Rounds struck the door and passenger side window, sending glass shards into the cab, embedding into both men inside. She circled to the back of the vehicle, delivering a few more shots into the rear and back window before ceasing fire. Returning to the driver's side door, she found Cook holding his ear. You okay? Madison asked. Yeah, just got some glass in my ear. And some ringing, Cook replied. Yeah, these things aren't known for the quietness, Madison quipped. I'll live, though, Cook assured her. You better, because we have a deal, Madison retorted. I assume they're going to be keeping a close eye on me for the next few days. So, first drop in a week, Cook replied. Do you know where? Madison inquired. Cook shook his head. I assume one of the southern drop points. I won't know where until I have some idea of the level of freedom they're going to give me. Madison agreed. Okay, I can live with that. Checking his watch, Cook immediately started the vehicle. If I'm going to make it back in time, I need to get going, Cook explained. What are you going to tell them about this town? Madison inquired. That it's heavily defended. Got a little too close to figure that out, though. Cook replied. Good man, Madison praised him. Cook took off as Madison, Connie, and Piper watched him disappear on the horizon. Piper voiced her concern. You think we can trust him? Madison expressed her belief. I think he's genuine when he says he wants to protect the civilians. That's honestly the best we can hope for at this point. Hopefully, he follows through with his promise of information. Connie added. Even if he doesn't, we have to assume that what he told us is true about them wanting to bring in heavy weaponry and more men, Madison said. Question is, what do we do about it? We're not exactly a massive fighting force, Piper asked. Madison acknowledged the challenge. I'll reach out to my people and see if they can help, but I wouldn't hold your breath. Do we try and contact the military? Let them know they have a problem, Connie asked. Madison considered their options. I'll see if my people can do it, but realistically, they aren't going to care at the moment with all their focus being on the invasion. So, we're on our own, Piper asked. At least for the time being, Madison confirmed. So, what's our next step, Connie asked. We do whatever the current task is in front of us which right now means we need to figure out how to get these people away from this town and to relative safety, Madison stated. I'll go back and siphon the gas from the truck, then find something big to put it in, Piper offered. We'll do a head count and ask around about other potential fuel sources, Connie suggested. The group nodded in agreement, 
And as they dispersed to complete their assignments, they suppressed the fear that lurked beneath the surface, knowing that greater challenges lay ahead. Chapter 9 Day Zero Plus 48 Atticus finished the report, his fingers wary as they danced across the keyboard. He leaned back in his chair, the weight of the information sinking in. He sighed audibly, rubbing his hands over his tired face. This is going to get so much worse, Atticus muttered, his voice heavy with resignation. Closing the report, he glanced at the remaining files piled on his desktop, a sea of paperwork waiting to be navigated. A quick scan revealed no more urgent, all caps titles. They appeared to be ordinary reports. As he pushed away from his desk, a knock echoed through the room. Come on in, Evelyn, Atticus called. Evelyn entered, concern in her eyes. Everything okay in here? I heard that sigh all the way in the kitchen. Atticus nodded, his expression grave. Yeah, just some bad things going on in Kansas. Evelyn raised an eyebrow. Doesn't explain the sigh, though, considering there's been nonstop bad news from Kansas. Atticus sighed again. The sigh was because I have to go out. Evelyn tilted her head, her concern deepening. Can it wait until after dinner? Shouldn't be too much longer. Atticus shook his head, afraid it can't wait. Just found out we're on a clock. Evelyn sighed, understanding the gravity of the situation. Okay, I'll get Susie fed, then wait for you. Atticus insisted, both of you eat, please. I don't want to be responsible for you starving. Evelyn chuckled and shook her head. You're the reason I'm eating as well as I am. Waiting on you is no big deal. Atticus smiled faintly. Eat when it's hot and ready. I don't know how long I'll be. If I'm not too late, though, I'll see about bringing home some dessert. Evelyn grinned. I think Susie would love that. Atticus winked. If I manage to get what I'm hoping for, you're going to love it, too. In that case, you better hurry up then, Evelyn teased. Get that business done so that dessert can get here. Atticus laughed and nodded as Evelyn left the room. He rose from his chair, retrieving his boots and slipping them on, grabbing a coat on his way out the door. The sun hung low on the horizon as Atticus hit the streets. People bustled about, running errands, carrying goods, and a visible presence of soldiers emphasized security in the city. Despite minor scuffles, there hadn't been any major issues in the city since the invasion ended. Still, the military leadership deemed it essential to maintain a visible presence on the streets reassuring the civilians of their protection. Atticus savored the stroll through the town, a welcome respite from hours spent staring at a computer screen. Finally, he reached his destination, the stadium. He approached the guard stationed at the doors of the office section. Afternoon, sir. Can I help you? One of the guards asked. I'm here to see Clint and Corporal Gad, Atticus replied. Are they expecting you? The guard inquired. No, but they have an open-door policy with me, because I'm working on a project for them, Atticus explained. The guard radioed in his request, and after a brief wait, he nodded and opened the door for Atticus. They're in the second-floor conference room, the guard informed him. Appreciate it, Atticus replied. Inside the stadium's office section, Atticus observed a hive of activity. People at desks worked diligently on various projects, both military and civilian. It was chaotic, but he continued through like a man on a mission. Ascending the stairs to the second floor, Atticus spotted a sign indicating the conference room. As he approached, he could hear a lively discussion emanating from within. Opening the door, Atticus found Clint and Corporal Gatt at the front of the room, engrossed in a meeting with a dozen individuals most of them soldiers. Maps of the city and the region adorned the walls, resembling intricate battle plans. Both men paused their presentation when they noticed Atticus standing at the back of the room. Atticus, you have some impeccable timing, Clint remarked. We could use an update on the Kansas situation, Corporal Gad added. Atticus replied with a sense of urgency, happy to give one. 
in private. Clint and Gad exchanged a glance, and Clint addressed the group. Gentlemen, if you'll excuse us for a few minutes. Corporal Gad added, Captain, if you wouldn't mind taking over the presentation. We'll be right back. One of the soldiers stood up, making way for Clint and Gad to join Atticus at the door. Got an office down the hall, Clint offered. The three men walked in silence, their expressions growing increasingly concerned with each step. Okay, Atticus, what the hell is going on? Why couldn't you talk in front of the soldiers? Clint inquired. Because the situation in Kansas is volatile, and if other soldiers hear what they're doing there, we're going to risk defections, Atticus explained. Clint pressed further. What about Gad here? He's a soldier. Atticus clarified. He's a paper pusher. Gad interjected. He's also in the room with you. Atticus apologized. Sorry, but are we wrong? Gad conceded. No, you're not. But still... Atticus continued, so what have you found out? Atticus's face was grim as he delivered the news. Captain Bennett is their ringleader, he revealed. He and his team had a major falling out with General Rothman. Clint's brow furrowed as he racked his brain. Rothman. Why does that name sound familiar? He was in charge of the failed Kansas City operation. Corporal Gad explained, disgust in his tone, got taken out in a civilian uprising. Atticus shook his head. No. He was hunted down and murdered by Captain Bennett and his men after he ordered the killing of dozens of severely wounded soldiers. Clint and Gad exchanged horrified glances, attempting to process the severity of the situation before stealing themselves once more. Christ. That's a lot to unpack, Clint muttered, running a hand through his hair. Wish the news got better, Atticus replied grimly. Corporal Gad's jaw was tight, almost afraid to ask. How bad is it out there? Atticus hesitated before answering bluntly. Captain Bennett has a force a thousand strong. Clint and Gad visibly recoiled at the revelation quickly finding something to sit on as their legs threatened to give out beneath them. It's mostly soldiers, Atticus continued, but there are some like-minded civilians who have joined their ranks. He took a deep breath before delivering the final blow. By all accounts, they've taken over a significant portion of the eastern part of the state. Jesus, that's not good, Corporal Gad remarked. Clint added, if there's only a thousand of them, then they're going to have their hands full between civilians fighting against them and zombies coming out of the cities. They're a backburner problem. Atticus disagreed firmly. No, they're a frontburner problem. Corporal Gad questioned, How do you figure... Atticus disclosed further. Agent Madison has a contact inside their group. I'll spare you the details on how they turned him, but I believe he's legit. According to his intel, Captain Bennett's group has made contact with other deserters spread across the Southwest, other deserters who are at military bases. Clint and Gad exchange concerned looks as they begin to put things together. Atticus nodded gravely. Yeah, you're putting those worst-case scenario pieces together, just like I did. The trio began to talk out loud, finishing one another's speculative thoughts as if they were one conversation. Captain Bennett convinces the civilians to join their cause, Clint suggested. Which we have to assume that he's already done, Atticus agreed. They figure out a way to get that heavy weaponry on the base to Kansas. Corporal Gad continued. Atticus's face was grim. They're already making plans to clear out a major airport and fly them in. Clint ran an anxious hand through his hair and we have to assume that they've talked to the militia groups that have been causing us some trouble, which would make the coming battle against them all the more difficult for us to win, Atticus concluded, especially since we still don't have bullets. The three men fell silent, the weight of their speculative worst-case scenario sinking heavily upon them. If even half of their assumptions were true, they were facing an impending disaster. So, 
How do we handle this? Clint asked. Concern etched on his face. You saw those maps in there. We're facing major threats on multiple fronts. Corporal Gad added, Not only that, but we can't even fully brief soldiers on the mission without running the risk of them defecting to what they might consider a better situation. Atticus acknowledged their concerns, then made his proposal. Yeah, I'll lead the mission. But I have conditions. Clint understood, as well you should. Extra rations for my family. They stay where they are. And I want a guard on them that you would trust with your life, Atticus said. Corporal Gad pointed out. Atticus, they're in the heart of Seattle. They're as safe as they're going to get. Atticus insisted. I said I want a guard on them. I'm going after a bunch of deserters who may have people within your ranks. If they somehow find out my identity, I need to be certain that they're safe. Clint assured him. I know someone for the job, civilian, loyal to me, and would be very excited to have one of my favors owed to him. Atticus added one more condition. I want veto power over the team. Corporal Gad readily agreed. I have no problem giving that to you. Not only is it your ass on the line, but we're going to need some help building up a team for you to take. Clint concurred. He's right. We're already stretched thin as it is, and with our options limited with soldiers. Atticus stressed his preference. I don't want any soldiers with me on this trip. Clint explained. I understand your hesitancy, but I have people I can personally vouch for. Lifers who are all about the mission. Atticus was firm. You better be 100% about them. Clint reassured him. I wouldn't suggest them otherwise. Atticus made it clear. Okay, but I want mostly civilians. Corporal Gad questioned, where the hell are we going to get them from? Most of the people in Seattle have no desire to go back out there. Clint smiled slyly. Oh, I know a few who would be eager to get out there. It's going to be a surgical force, though, Corporal Gad acknowledged. Even if we had the manpower, we don't have the firepower to send with you to compete with Bennett's group. Atticus shared his strategy. Don't need an overwhelming force. Just need enough to cause them headaches and to disrupt what they want to do with expansion plans. Clint noted, when you phrase it like that, you make it sound like a suicide mission. Corporal Gad added, pretty sure we might want to put a different spin on it on the recruitment pitches. The room lightened briefly with laughter before they returned to the gravity of the situation. So, what's the timeline? Atticus asked. Clint revealed the urgency. You need to be gone in 72 hours. Atticus remarked. Not wasting time, huh? Clint nodded gravely. It's the last train out of town for a while. We're planning an operation shortly after that. And if it all goes to plan. Corporal Gad finished Clint's thought. We're going to be kicking up a hornet's nest. Atticus concluded... Well, just be sure you get it calmed down, because I'm going to want to come home eventually. Corporal Gad reassured him, We'll do our best for you. Clint added the final note. Look, Atticus, hate to cut this short, but we need to get back to that briefing. Go home, get some rest, watch some cartoons with that adorable kid of yours. Let's reconvene at 9 tomorrow morning. Atticus grinned. You bring the coffee. Clint promised, consider it done. The men shook hands as Atticus left the room. He wandered through the bustling office area, his thoughts consumed by the impending mission and the enormity of the challenges ahead. Atticus knew that something big was coming, and he was right in the thick of it. It might not be the largest front, but if his intuition was correct, it was the most crucial one. The End <laughs>